for millions of years. Mankind lived just like the animals. Then something happened which unleashed the power of our imagination. We weren't the talk. I mean, you know, there are school groups and organizations where abstinence-only education is what they teach in school. How, wh you know, have you completely forgotten what you were like as a teenager? I think they have. I mean, you know, don't pretend, don't do this back in the old days crap. Um, uh, well, we just didn't do stuff like that when no, I was a kid. You just well, maybe you're no. homely. No, no, no. They, they, but other they people were having sex. Right. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you didn't get in on the action, <laughs> but kids are going to have sex. Do you know why? Because it's a biological imperative. That's what puberty is. It's nature encouraging the reproductive cycle. Right. It's saying, Hey, let's get busy and start having kids. And what you're doing is saying, Nope, hold off. Yeah, that'll work. Well, just no, say not, no. And it's not even just about saying don't do it. It's about saying if you do, you're completely unacceptable. Right. That's the thing that I think clinches it for me. It's like you have a child that couldn't come and talk to you, and you're disappointed with her. Yeah. That's what blows my mind. You set up a situation. It's your job as a parent to keep the lines of communication open. It's not the child's job to make a relationship with her parents. It's a parent's job to create a relationship in a family environment for the kid. And if that child doesn't feel like she's even able to come and talk to you, like you would be able to even understand what she's going through or what she wants to say or how she's feeling, my God, what have you done? Amen. What have you done? And I'm tired of people messing up their kids. And this is the situation where you create a child that cannot function. They can't come to you. You can't talk to them. There is no adult advice that they're getting. And they're making these choices that are going to affect them. And you're keeping them ignorant. You're not, you're not available to them as a source of, of uh, inspiration or a source of information. And then when the child gets in trouble because they were ignorant, you say, I'm so disappointed with my child. And, and we got a homeschooler so the neighbors don't find out about that it's not about where did I mess up and my God, what did we do wrong here? That our kid was so afraid of us that she couldn't come and talk to us. There is one bit of good news in this story. These particular parents are so colossally irresponsible that they're willing to completely shirk any responsibility and put the kid up for adoption. Correct. And the reason I say it's a good thing is that now we've increased the likelihood that this next generation from, from this gene pool will not be subjected to the same kind of ignorance and apathy that they, that the, that their parents received. Uh, I, I can only anyway. hope that this kid goes to a good home where there are parents who are, uh, loving, intelligent, responsive, encouraging, who form a proper family. That's not just a put your foot down. You're doing what I'm saying. And if you don't, then you're just a, you know, you're the screw up. Instead of you can come to me with anything. Yeah. Don't be afraid to come to me. You know, and we'll talk about it. I might not be happy about it, but I definitely want to know what's going on in your life. And if it's something I'm not going to like, I still want to know. And I'm still going to love you. And it's not, you know, it's not going to matter. We'll figure it out. That's what you need to offer. Right. And when, what I'm saying here is this is parents. I mean, they don't, like you say, they don't talk about their religious perspective, but it just, it exudes from the letter. Mm -hmm. So you've got these parents who are, who are, if they're not doing this for religious right reasons, they are the, the model religious right parents yeah. based on the situation, whether they are or not. You've got this situation which is going to occur when you follow the, the uh, recipe of the religious right and the abstinence only, you know, methodology. And you get this, set up for failure. You're going to fail and then we're going to hammer you about it. We're going to make horrible consequences for you and you're going to see how bad you messed up your life because you didn't do what God wanted you to do. And and then when you go and you do what God wants you to do, well then your parents are behind you. You got to be but you got to be penitent. You got to come and say how ashamed you are of how horribly you messed up and look what you did and look how ashamed we all are and you've embarrassed the entire family and you sinned against God. And then this kid go, runs the gauntlet of shame deals with whatever she has to deal with the rest of her life, a child that she knows is out there that's hers, that she may or may not have any, you know, connection to. Um, you know, this this is gonna haunt her for the rest of her life in a in an environment where she's in a religious, you know, uh 
environment where people are going to judge her for that. And, you know, okay, well, you're forgiven now and it's all wiped clean, but boy, you know, that was a mistake. That's, that's the whole reason that Jesus needed to die. Um, because stupid things like you just did. And in the end, the only way she's going to be accepted is to say, I'm very sorry for what I did. And I'm going to live my life for God now. And, you know, look what happened when I didn't, I just got nothing but hammered. So she grabs hold of that, you know, magic feather. And then from that point on, you know, my life was never so good as when I went back and picked up that magic feather again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's no surprise. And, and, I, and on another note to the parents, I have a sneaking suspicion based on what they've said. And this is something that they're probably going to hang over her head forever. Every time she starts to make anything that they view as a misstep, uh, it'll be, it'll come back to oh. the, oh, yes. This is going to turn out just like that time that you well, got the pregnant thing, and they had thing, to cover for you. God help her if the 10-year-old ends up in the same situation. Oh, yeah. Well, then that's going to be her fault, too. Well, look well, at the example you set for your sister, and you're the one, you're responsible for this if she hadn't seen you do it. The only thing is is that if the 10-year-old ends up in the same situation when she's 16, she'll have a 22-year-old sister who may actually have learned something from this who can help her get away from a couple of ignorant parents who are unwilling to you know, uh, love and help their children. Anyway, but my point with things like this is I don't give credit to a religion for giving somebody self-esteem and helping the girl get through this when the religion itself is responsible for for the error or for whatever consequences you know occur Um, making the problem if you made the problem and then you offer some ounce of help to, to try to get it resolved no you don't get credit for that you know it's your responsibility to resolve it completely and to say that this, you know, this is a situation that can never be resolved. It's like trying to stuff the genie back in the bottle. This is done. Yeah. You know, so this can't be fixed. So religion here has made a situation where this cannot be fixed. It can only be, you know, the mess can be only cleaned up to a certain level and that's going to be it. And I'm not going to give religion credit if this girl says the only way I got through it was because of, you know, my religion and all the people that helped me at my church. And it's like, no, I, I don't give it credit. It, you, you messed her up. And so whatever help you gave her, you owed her. And the same with her parents. Whatever help you give her, whatever help you deny her, you know, you shouldn't deny her anything. But whatever help you give her, you owe it to her. So don't pretend that you're doing so much for her. You're doing it to clean up your own mess. And, you know, that's my rant for this week. <laughs> And a damn good rhyme at that. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully.